God is good. All the time. It's so good to see all of you today. I'm always delighted to come to Greenwood. You know, I wish I could sing like that choir, but when I was a very young pastor, one Sunday there was a note on the pulpit. It said, announce the hymn and step back. So I've been a little, uh, you know, uh, a little concerned, so I don't sing, but I'll try to preach a little bit. Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them as their God. God will be, they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more, mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. Amen. Amen. Giving honor to God and to Pastor Johnson. I want to raise with you this morning a question that the psalmist raised for us centuries ago. How do you sing the Lord's song in a strange and foreign land? That's our context, isn't it? Here among the turbulence of our time, in the midst of all the crises, all of the hate, all of the anger, all of the retribution, all of the division, how do we sing the Lord's song in a strange and foreign world? And I want to turn to the book of Revelation to see if there isn't some clue, some, some direction about how we in this time, in this day, sing the Lord's song. But first we need to pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence, and we thank you for your faithfulness. We didn't come by here today just to get some opinion about something. We came by here to hear from you. We pray in your mercy, speak to us. Touch our hearts, order our steps, inform our minds. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The book of Revelation is a strange book, often misinterpreted and misunderstood. But John, the author of the book, is in prison, house arrest, under house arrest. It's late in the first century of the Christian church. Scholars tell us there's about 80,000 Christians scattered around Asia Minor in small communities, households of faith. But John is in prison. And he's in prison because there's a new emperor named Domitian. And Domitian, as was his right, has invoked the imperial cult. That means he's divine. The emperor is divine. So to be a good citizen of the Roman Empire... If someone asks you who is Lord, the politically correct answer would be 
Domitian. Now that's a problem. That's a problem for Christians. That's a problem for Jews. It's a problem for faith believers. And John, having already been placed in arrest, has somehow to get the word out to the Christians assembled in Asia Minor about what to do when trouble comes. Now, John John can't write in Greek, plain language. The oppressor can read. So John writes in an apocalyptic, wild, imaginative method in which he wants to lay out not some view of future coming, but some instruction for faithful living then. Now, it's not unusual for Christians to use codes when they are in trouble. You know, back in the days of chattel slavery, hymns were often codes. Way in the water. That means the coast is clear. Get on out of here. Right? Steal away. Steal away home to Jesus. We think it's a baptismal song. And it was, but it was also go north, get get out of here. So you wouldn't be surprised that in the book of Revelation we have code language to tell us not so much about what's going to happen in the future, but how to be successful and faithful now, then. And there are two key images which one needs to understand in Revelation to understand how it all breaks out. One is Babylon. Now, there was no such thing as Babylon when John was writing. Babylon was a, a kingdom that had fallen But it stood for captivity. It it stood for oppression. It, It stood for those working against God. Then there was Jerusalem. Jerusalem had also been destroyed. But Jerusalem stood for just the opposite of Babylon. It stood for the throne of God, the place of God, the work of God, the people of God. Now, in the book of Revelation, if you read carefully, Babylon is doomed. Jerusalem is blessed. Babylon is damned. Jerusalem is saved. Babylon shall die. Jerusalem shall emerge. That's why you have this picture that I read from the 21st chapter about the new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, a new Jerusalem where there's no more pain and no more suffering, no more sorrow and no more death and new life. Now, how are these images important to Christians who are living in Asia Minor? See, Domitian's men are going to come along, Christians, and knock on your door. And they're going to want to know, who is Lord? Ain't no joke. Who is Lord? Now, you know, Christians can be pretty, pretty, uh, what what can I say? Yeah, and slippery, right? (laughs) You know, it's like, now God, you know I love you more than anybody. But, you know, you got to go along to get along. You know, if, if someone comes knocking on my door and say, who is Lord? <coughs> I know who's Lord, but I'm going to say Domitian because, you know, I got to, I got to survive in these days. Now, j- in, in Revelation, that's called adultery and fornication. 
It's not talking about sex acts. It's talking about sleeping with the enemy. See, so the stakes are kind of high. Now, if, if the government comes and asks, who do you support? If they come and ask, who is your Savior? If they come and ask, who is your Lord? You don't get to say, Domitian. You must stand up looking fully at that which is coming toward you with its power and with its might and with its misery, but you also need to look beyond the now to the not yet because I'm telling you, above, look one eye here and the other eye come because something's coming. There's going to be a new heaven and a, a new earth, and that new heaven and that new earth will outlast and undo that Babylonian agent standing at your door. So Revelation is in some ways a very political, prophetic book which is trying to gear up response as to the Christian communities of that time so they will not be unfaithful. Actually, what he's calling for is sanctified resistance. Sanctified resistance in the face of evil. Sanctified resistance in the face of evil. Sanctified resistance. Now, you know, here in America, we, we like to have it both ways. We'd like Babylonian favor and Jerusalem favor. That's why we have the American flag and the Christian flag flying like, like they're the same thing. Sanctified resistance means understanding that we live in Babylon. And Babylon is not Jerusalem. Babylon is Babylon. And in these Babylonian times, with all the winds of war, the forces of hate and destruction, Christian churches must find a way not to compromise, but to what? Resist. Resist in speech, resist in prayer, resist in action, resist with our money, resist with our hearts, resist with our gospel. It ain't no time to go halfway. It's no time to try to kiss and make up with the world because you want the pension. Sanctified resistance. We don't live in Jerusalem. We live in Babylon, but with the power of Christ, we move toward Jerusalem. We seek the new Jerusalem. We live as if the new Jerusalem. We work toward the new Jerusalem. Sanctified resistance. So communities of faith, whether they're this size or smaller or larger, are all centers for resistance training, for learning the word, for learning how to pray, for learning how to sing, for learning how to survive, for learning how to witness, to learning how to have joy. Because in the midst of the mess, we still have the splendor of the promise. God promises, promising us something that Babylon cannot provide. Healing, reconciliation, Health, hope, joy, purpose, and salvation. We need communities just like this one to understand that resistance in this world is at the heart of being a disciple at this time. Resist evil. Resist compromise. Resist giving in. Resist standing down. Resist being quiet. Resist turning the other way. Resist being a a chump of evil. How do you sing the Lord's song in a strange and foreign land? How do you lift up the words, make the power known, raise the song so that others can sing, Oh, what a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Just the closer walk with thee. Jesus, Jesus, that's my plea. 
We got to be able to sing. And if I weren't a Baptist, I'd say dance. <laughs> Shout and act. And this church, this, 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 this band of disciples is all you need to do it. You don't need to be a Riverside. You don't need to be a mega church. You just need to be you. Sing it, pray it, tell it, hang on, hold on, be together. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't let up. Oh, hallelujah. I can see a new heaven and a new earth. I can also see this old heaven and this old earth that's in decay, but I, I look beyond the now to the not yet. Because it's coming. Coming through you and coming through me and coming through us. Don't give in. And don't give up. And don't get discouraged. Just keep on dreaming and hoping and singing and praying. Sanctified. Amen. Resistance. 